The Lochner era takes its name from the now infamous decision in Lochner versus New York. Like Dred Scott and Plessy v. Ferguson, Lochner is a case that is famous today for being wrong. The Lochner decision used the Due Process Clause as a basis to invalidate a state law intended to improve conditions for bakery workers. It became a symbol of an entire way of thinking about economic regulations. By way of reminder, from approximately 1890 to 1937, economic reform laws enacted by the federal government were called into question by narrow interpretations of Congress's enumerated powers. Meanwhile, the due process clauses were applied in ways that made it difficult for both the federal government and state governments to pursue economic reforms. Due process is an individual right, symbolized by the right-hand faces in the diagram. As rights to be free of economic regulations increased, the ability of government to enact these laws was correspondingly limited at both levels. The Due Process Clause reflects ideas that can be traced back hundreds of years to English law from the time of the Magna Carta in the year 1215. In the first round of amendments to the U.S. Constitution, the Fifth Amendment included a Due Process Clause as part of the Bill of Rights. John Marshall's 1833 decision in Barron v. Baltimore clarified that the entire Bill of Rights, as it then existed, was a law that limited the federal government and not state governments. After the Civil War, the nation decided that states should also be bound by a due process clause. So virtually identical language was added to Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. The due process clauses protect liberty, but the term liberty is not defined. So how do we know which types of liberty are the protected ones? Certainly no reasonable constitution would guarantee everyone the liberty to rob banks, to assault other people, or to drive the wrong way on a one-way street. Deciding which liberties are protected is one of the great ongoing debates of constitutional law. The defining feature of Lochner era due process was its conviction that freedom of contract was one of the liberties protected by due process. If a person has freedom to make contracts without being limited by the government, this ought to include the freedom to enter into a contract where an employee works for more than 40 hours a week, or the freedom to enter into a contract where an employer pays less than minimum wage. One barrier to understanding the Lochner era freedom of contract cases is that they use the concept of police powers differently than we do today. To avoid being confused when reading these cases, you should focus on the main idea, which is that freedom of contract was considered to be a constitutionally protected right. The idea of the police power was really a subsidiary idea, with the main idea being freedom of contract. So let me explain what the police power does and does not mean in these cases. As we've discussed previously, states are not limited to a list of enumerated powers. They have the ability to make laws on any subject. This ability to pass laws on any subject is often referred to today as the police power. Understood very broadly, this is the power to enact laws for the health, safety, welfare, and morals of the community, and under modern interpretations, the welfare of the community can be just about anything. Now, the state's unenumerated powers, which are often described in shorthand as being police powers, are then subject to structural limitations and individual rights limitations. In Lochner-era cases, the police power idea is not used so much to describe the source of a state's unenumerated power to pass laws. Instead, it's used to describe a limit on this federal right of freedom of contract. So the logic of constitutional freedom of contract works like this in a case involving a state law. We begin with the state having unenumerated powers. They're constrained by structural limits on the one side and individual rights on the other. Now one of those individual rights is the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause, which protects liberty. One of those liberties is the freedom to enter into contracts. 
but not just any contracts. Due process protects people's liberty to enter into those contracts that could not be regulated under an idealized version of the police power that deals only with health, safety, welfare, and morals as those terms are narrowly understood. If you're feeling confused by these different versions of the police power, don't worry. The idea as it's used in Lochner-era opinions is pretty circular. In fact, a cynic would say that under Lochner, people had a constitutional right to enter into whatever contracts they wanted, except when they didn't have such a right. The theory behind freedom of contract was a bit fuzzy, but the results of the cases tended to follow a general pattern. Laws that regulated contracts to improve workers' positions in the labor market were often, but not always, found invalid. And laws that regulated contracts for other reasons, such as workers' on-the-job health and safety, were often, but not always, upheld. In these years, the Supreme Court was quite skeptical of what it called labor laws. For example, it struck down a maximum hour law in Lochner, and it struck down a minimum wage law in Adkins. So in this line of cases, a majority of the courts seem to be adopting a pretty skeptical position towards economic regulation. However, in these same years, the court upheld other kinds of laws that arguably restricted people's liberties under the Due Process Clause. These included things like freedom from mandatory vaccination or freedom from involuntary sterilization. Without a doubt, there were exceptions to these patterns. A full understanding of the Due Process Clause as it was used in the early 20th century would have to be very nuanced. But for current purposes, we should focus on the Supreme Court's treatment of economic rights, exemplified by the Lochner idea of freedom of contract.